how holy is our God? Well, there's no, there's no chart of holiness, right? You're either holy or you're not. And he declares that, well, we declare that he is. But you know what? He declares that you are too. You are his holy people. And that has been declared over you regardless of what you have done. That is grace right there in that moment. So sending his son to earth and allowing his son to go through all that he went through uh, allowed us to come into that place where God sees you as holy, as righteous, as complete. You are holy. Absolutely holy. I want you to greet someone that you didn't come to church with or someone you're not married to. Welcome to church. How good are these blinds? Yeah. <laughs> if we did, last year when we did not have these blinds, when we have days like today, we were seriously considering doing church downstairs because it was too hot to be in this room. And uh, last year, when it was 35 degrees outside, we'd be handing water to you as you came in. It's hot, but it's not where it was before. And so it's just great to have uh, blinds like this just to be able to cool us down a little bit. Yeah. So much to thank God for. We're going to take up our tithes and offerings, then I'm going to thank God for some more people. So if you've come prepared, that's great. If you haven't let the bag pass on by, just want to say thank you to you for your generosity that you've given to the church over the year. How beautiful is Susie? Is she not beautiful? I said to Susie this morning, I said, when are you going to start singing with us in the worship team? She said, when I'm nearly 12. She has such a beautiful voice. She can do cartwheels that I cannot do. She's even trying a hand at a no-handed cartwheel. Anyone, can anyone do that? A no-handed cartwheel? That would just go horribly wrong. And uh, I'd have to call the ambulance for me. I can do it in my imagination, is what Lily said. I think even in my imagination, I'd probably hurt myself. It's so beautiful to see children. It's so beautiful to see the hearts of the children that are inside of our church. And I want to thank God for every single one. Such purity and such truth that flows through them most times. most adorable face and it's not just Susie, every child but you know what, God sees us as he sees Susie he knows we don't get it always right and I'm sure there's times where he rolls his eyes and gets frustrated and wants to apply the right hand of instruction to the seat of learning is that how they, how they say it? I don't know but again we see grace and so this morning I just want to lift Susie up. I want you to close your eyes and just think about Susie for a moment and maybe the Lord will give you a picture for Susie. Has anyone got a picture or a word for Susie? Beautiful. Victor, what do you got? Daisy. As delicate as a daisy. What colour is the daisy that you see in your imagination? white so it's pure it declares faith over her who else saw anything there what did you see Alanda you saw a sunshine the glory of God flows out of her that makes me cry who else saw a pony it's not strange for Trish to see ponies is it the ponies mean freedom anyone else one more saw a white lily so once again, it's a flower of life and a place of purity. Is that cool? Just in one little space this morning, we've taken a time just to speak such beauty and purity over Susie. It's what we see, my gorgeous girl. And it's what I believe that will flow from your life all the days that you're on this planet. Let's just pray. And so, Father, we say thank you for Susie and we thank you for her life, her heart. We thank you for her, her family, her parents. And Jesus, we just want to pray 
that that glory and that life and that light will flow through her back into her family, back into her brother and her sister, her mom and dad. And I pray, Father, through this Christmas, Lord, that Susie will have the joy in in the moment of encountering Christ in such a powerful way. And so, Lord, we so thank you for it. But, Lord, right now we say thank you for tithes and offerings. Lord, we just thank you for all that they're going to be used for in the days that are ahead of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Church news. Keep going, Laura. That sounds awesome. Can we do that? How good is Laura? The phrase that I use so often with people is that you, you leak what you carry. What the Lord places in you, you cannot contain it. You have to actually, it flows from you. And so when we see Susie, we see something of Laura. Do you get that? And so the words that you've spoken for Susie are the same words you could probably speak back into Laura or Darren. When Susie stands and she has her own children in times to come, you will see something that Laura has leaked into Susie that Susie has then leaked into her children. That's what we call a generational blessing. Christmas time is a, is a time for generational blessings to flow. But I'm not preaching this morning, so I will stop. Lisa's going to come up and preach in a second. Church news is very simple and very quick. Uh, we have church tomorrow at 9 a.m. Yes, that's what I was waiting for, just for one of those. We have morning tea after today. We also have morning tea after tomorrow, Christmas cake and all kinds of things for tomorrow. It's always just such a great time to be in the house of God. And I uh, just encourage you to come on out at, for 9 a.m. tomorrow. I get it that it's early, but uh, it doesn't seem to keep people away. And people love meeting together first thing in the morning on a Christmas day. Uh, and so plan to be back out tomorrow if you're not and encounter something more of the kingdom of God right here in Haberfield. Now... Before we get Lisa up, I just want to say thank you to a couple of people, uh, or when I say a couple of people, to a church. For the year that we've had, we've had this most extraordinary year of God's Spirit being poured out upon so many people. And we're watching and seeing God do things that maybe we have not seen or maybe we haven't seen for the longest time. And, and so many people do stuff around this place that nobody ever sees. Okay, like even our worship team, you see the, the half an hour of what we do to bring but you don't see all that goes behind the scenes to bring it to where we are and how this team serves you and serves us and so if you're in this team if you're a part of this worship team even if you're not been up here on the platform today I want to say thank you with all of my heart for all that you give you put up with me uh, but you you just give so much and, and when I say hey I'm doing a new song there's that moment where everyone goes, oh, okay, let's see. But all of a sudden, what you see this morning is what happened. And so when we did Little Drummer Boy, that was the first time we had a crack at that one that we were going to do. And yeah, there were some bumps and bruises, but we got there. And then you got blessed by it because of these guys' hearts and willingness to go the extra mile. So I want to say thank you to that. But there's so many other parts of our church to say thank you to God for. And it's from the ones who do morning tea or welcome. It's the leaders of our church. It's the kids' church leaders. It's the, the playgroup leaders, scripture, there are so many parts of our church that operate and happen without so many of us seeing it. But I just want to take a time just to say thank you for all that you have sown because you have leaked something into our church that's brought us to where we are today. And I know that as we go into 2018, again, what we carry now is what we leak next year. Lastly, I want Ida to come up because I want to say thank you to Ida. Uh, Ida, for all, and she does so much that nobody really knows about. Um, and we, you're not going anywhere. We're going to pray for Ida. So Ida serves three days, four days a week pretty much with, with Sunday included. And she does so much that nobody ever sees. And I just wanted to take this time in this service just to pray for her and her family and to lift her up as she goes into 2018 because I just think God's got more in store for her than she even knows. Underrate, you underrate yourself way too much, don't you? See, she said yes. So that's a prophetic statement into 2018. 
to see the Spirit of God walk, working and moving through her is just going to be a joy for you people and a joy for myself. So let's just pray together. Father in heaven, I say thank you for Ida. And she represents so much of what happens inside of this church in a day-in, day-out basis. And Lord, just to take this time to honour her, but Lord, you honour her far greater than whatever we could because when you look at her, you see greatness. When you look at her, you see the Spirit of God. When you look at her, you see a woman who is leading people to the kingdom. When you look at her, you see a woman who is drawing people back together. And so, Lord, today, with that blessing over her, I pray, Father, that you'll just speak into her for the year 2018 and beyond for all that she does for the kingdom of God. May she come into the fullness of your spirit and the abundance of your life this very day in ways that she has not even yet seen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Where's Rochelle? Trish, can you come to the front, please? So in keeping with the spirit of thank you. It's handing over of the reins at the sound desk. Uh, so really, I'm, I'm on behalf of the church because we can't all come up here. It would be a little bit crowded. Um, but we also want to say thank you to both of you for the incredible year um, that it's been. And um, this is a gift from the church to both of you. Um, and I, as I was thinking about um, all this this morning, <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny way of going about it. But I thought about the, the Israelites and Moses and how they had said to Moses, you go, you go and you meet with God for us because they were too scared um, to do that. But what we have here, and I think all of you would agree with me with the kind of year we've had, is that we don't say that to our leaders. We say, no, take us with you. But that's because of how you hold God. And we want what you have um, and what leaks out of you and the feast that both of you are. And we also appreciate that we know that the leaders, you know, you're at the front and so you get hit first. Um, and so we just appreciate your vulnerability and your weaknesses and your struggles um, because we're coming behind you. And what an amazing, incredible year that it's been, you know, so thank you so much. Church, would you like to give them a hand? I think that would be appropriate. And, and in, keeping, in, in keeping with the way that we do church here at Haberfield, and you've seen it already this morning with the offering with Susanna, I, I had this idea that I, I thought it would be great for us, out of the fruit of what um, Matt and Trish have done this year, for us to share um, some words and, and visions and that sort of thing with them. But I know that we sort of just call them out and that sort of thing, but I wanted to take that to another level today because I thought it would be really lovely to actually capture those. Um, so they're going to kill me, but <laughs> Jazz and Honor, can you come forward and get these little pieces of paper? You can kill me later. But it is Christmas, so be nice to your mother. <laughs> and you're all my witnesses. They're not allowed to hurt me. Um, so what, just give one to everyone, please. What I'd like you to do is just to take a moment, I, we will pray for um, Matt and Trish in a moment, but I'd like you to just to take a moment now, there's um, pens often in front of all the rows there, and to ask God for a word, a vision, a verse, anything that he wants to speak um, to Matt and Trish. It might be for this year, it might be for the year to come, but I just think it would be wonderful to bless them um, with that because I think that's the fruit of what we've had this year, our relationship with God and hearing from God. So we'll just take a couple of minutes to do that. Okay, I'll, you, can, you can finish that in your own time. I feel like it's school. <laughs> but Lily and Ida can, and Claudia, can you come up? And, and Lisa, and we'll pray uh, for, for Matt and Trish. Father God, we just, um, in this time of giving and gifts and celebrating you, Lord God, we, we thank you for the gift and the celebration that Matt and Trish are to each one of us in this building. Lord God, I thank you that um, they have leaked, they have ministered you out of their strength and out of their weaknesses. They have shown your glory, Lord God. And Father, we do want to know you more and we want to follow them 
in, in the path that you've given us. Father, as we think about this time last year and the closing of the preschool and the difficult time that was for so many people, Lord God, and then we see what you've done over this year, more than we could have ever imagined or ever hoped for. So we thank you, Lord God. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you've done through Matt and through Trish. We thank you for the Hope Centre and just the, the beginning of the gift that that is going to be as well. The seeds that are sown, the lives that are going to be changed, the freedom that is going to come out of that place. We thank you for their courage. We thank you for their faith and we thank you for their love that they give to each one of us. And we just ask that you would bless them. Bless them beyond they could ever imagine, Lord God. In your name, amen. Thank you. Good morning. It's me again. How good is Christmas Eve? I reckon Christmas Eve is like my most favourite day of the entire year, I reckon. Like it's not even about presents or anything. I guess for me it's just that expectation, you know. It's, it's that that excited buzz, ooh, what, what's going to happen, what, what could possibly be. Um, so it's my favourite day of the year, so this is a great day to be here. Um, my family is quite big, we're islanders, so it's unending, it's eternal. <laughs> <laughs> Boundless, that's it, abundant. <laughs> um, but every, you know, we, we, get, we get a list of like jobs that everyone's got to do tomorrow, you know, and so... You're gearing yourself, you're thinking, oh, okay, you know, lots of people got to do lots of stuff. And, and we, get to the, we get this text message from my aunt and um, it's got everyone's name and, and the job that they have to do, you know. And some people have got these big lists like you've got to marinate this or cook that or make that. And I'm looking down the list trying to find my name. I get right almost to the end and it says, Amanda and Lisa, Amanda, my cousin and Lisa, make fruit salad. And I'm like... Yeah, so I, I, I call my cousin, I'm like, dude, we got off super breezy this year. She's like, I know. I'm like, I know, right? So that was my icebreaker. It's good to be here. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about New Year's Eve. So I thought, oh, sorry, Christmas Eve. Yes, Christmas Eve, not New Year's Eve. <gasps> Jump in the gun, you know? Um, so I thought that we could start Christmas Eve with a little bit of a story because stories are great Christmas Eve. Once upon a time, hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, the story of Christmas began. A plan in wait, a plan in preparation. The prophecy told in Isaiah 9, hundreds of years prior said, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and peace will never end. His rule with, he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. But God's people waited and waited suffering in heartbreak and pain, crying out in oppression, desperate to break the yoke of deep darkness. They longed for a prophet, a word, a sign, a miracle, something to give them hope. They felt abandoned, believing that their God had left them. They longed to be rescued, to find relief and release hope, draining from their tired and weak hearts. But in the stillness, in the barren wait, God was drawing near. God was about to make himself known. Some expected a warrior to arrive with fire and might, strength and power. But nowhere could they see a sword or a shield. Some expected a king to come with authority and justice, ruling with kindness but nowhere could they see a crown or a throne. Others expected a hero, a rescuer, brave and strong, wise and full of heart, but there was not a white horse in sight until suddenly, 2,000 years ago, on this very night, God drew near. "'Twas the night before Christmas, the night sky 
twinkled with gems, a rainbow splatter of light adorned the deepening sky. They, the sound of shuffling footsteps, some light, some heavy, some quick, some slow, began to fill the streets. Fragrant jasmine tinted the air, settling on the heads, the shoulders, the skin of men as they gathered, gathered to discuss, gathered to report, gathered to dream. The sugary hum of sweet exhale rose from the land as people began to unwind for the evening, shedding the day's toil. Did they know? Did they know it was the night before Christmas? In the air, birds sought out their evening branch, drawing in their soaring wings soar, while in the fields, beasts bent their knee to rest, leaving the rest of the day till tomorrow. As the earth turned in its bed, rocks preparing their cries in wait, did they know? Did they know it was the night before Christmas? Children ran through the streets, three, four, five, chasing laughter like it were a ball. A ball filled with adventure and the buoyant exploration of a youth who leaps toward tomorrow. While women walked behind them, the glint of warmth in their eyes, sharing, sharing to love, sharing to give, sharing to hope. And as the night deepened, all of heaven watched on. Angels edging forward in their seats without even noticing. The weight becoming weighty and full, gripping, riveting, magnetic. Did they know? Did any of them know it was the night before Christmas? The night when, that will leave us forever changed this very night, 2,000 years ago. Did they know? Across town, the air began to fill with an excitement. A firefly rush like butterflies, only lighter. As a man ushered his very heavily pregnant wife-to-be into a room. Feet walking slow, minds running fast, breath retracting, whispers heightening. They were in the last place in town. And the last place in town was the last place he ever thought they would be. It was the last place he ever hoped they would be. You see, Joseph had a plan, and it was a great plan. Fresh towels, clean boiled water, an experienced midwife surrounded with all of their belongings in a calm and familiar space in the comfort of their own home. He had a plan to do his very best to be prepared and perfectly fulfill the plans of the Lord God Almighty. But that night, God's plan was something that Joseph could never have planned for. And in the chaos, in the makeshift plans and hasty beds, crowded rooms and overcrowded expectations, in the chaos of displacement and uncertainty, of second-guessing himself and double-handling self-doubt, Joseph, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of messy imperfection, watched as the perfect promise of the Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, was laid peacefully in a manger. Sometimes we might look at our lives and look at the circumstances and wonder what God could ever do with our mess. But this very night, 2,000 years ago, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of mess, hope was born, and God did something that changed us forever. He arrived. Did Joseph know that it was the night before Christmas? I would like to know if he knew. He knew the prophecy, the prophecy told in Isaiah hundreds of years prior that said, for a child is born, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Joseph knew the prophecy. And he knew that the angel Gabriel visited him that night and said to him, the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit and he will have a son and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Joseph knew he saw the angel that night but he also knew that he had encountered God that night. 
And Joseph also knew what Mary had said. Mary told him that the angel Gabriel had visited her too, saying in Luke 1.32, He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give, will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Joseph knew these things. He had all the facts, but did he really know that it was the night before Christmas? I think it's highly unlikely that he did. I think it's highly unlikely that he really understood the magnitude of God's plans that night and what exactly it was that he was signing up for. He couldn't have known that he was going to be a part of a plan that would split time change the course of history and restore mankind forever. Sometimes, even when we have all the facts and we have all the info and we're watching things unfold, sometimes it's still hard to believe that God will create something great. Sometimes it can be hard to believe that God can use our mess and our chaos. And when we find ourselves in that place, it becomes very easy to get stuck, to get stuck and forget that there's a bigger picture, a much bigger picture of restoration, a much bigger picture of God drawing near and making himself known to us. When God is at work in our lives, we don't usually know all the details. We don't usually have all the facts and know exactly how things are going to play out. And like Joseph 2,000 years ago, we don't always know what God's going to do, but we do know who God is. God is a God of love and mercy and grace. He is a God of miracles and wonder. God is the God of bigger pictures and the God of all things great. And God is the God who is not afraid of mess or chaos. So let's talk about Joseph. We don't know a whole lot about him. The Bible doesn't talk a lot about him, but it does say a lot about him. In Matthew 1, when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant, in verse 19, it says, Joseph, to whom Mary was engaged, was a righteous man, and he did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. We, we know clearly Joseph was a kind and compassionate man. We know that. But let's put ourselves in his shoes for a moment and draw some assumptions based on what we know about human nature. So, your fiancé comes to you and they tell you that they're having a baby with someone else. And yes, she said it was the Holy Spirit, but come on, really? Who ever heard of anything like that before? It's, it's out there. I imagine when Joseph, had of her, when Joseph heard the news, he would have felt betrayed, confused, um, embarrassed, possibly disgraced. At the very least, he would have been hurt. And then, on top of that, there's, what are people going to think? What are people going to say? What am I going to say when people say what they're going to say? Like all of these things would have been running through his mind and right there in the midst of jo Joseph's mess and chaos, God arrived. God arrived with a plan to make himself known, a plan to make himself known to Joseph. In verse 20, it says, as Joseph considered all of this, all of his hurt, all of his confusion, as he considered his sense of betrayal, um, so as Joseph considered all of this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It goes on to say, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel commanded and took Mary as his wife. Long before the birth of Jesus, in the midst of Joseph's chaos, in the midst of his sense of hurt and betrayal, lay a hunger for God, a hunger to know God more, such a desire that he allowed God to interrupt him. He allowed him to interrupt his plans. He allowed him to interrupt his hurt 
And Joseph chose to lay all of those things aside and trust that God was at work fulfilling a much greater plan. We've been talking a lot about interruptions lately and, and it really makes me think about Bible characters and how God interrupted them. I think it's a, a really cool idea. I think we should keep doing it. The Bible says that Joseph had already made his decision. He had already planned to break off the engagement. He, he might have already had the ball rolling. We don't know that. But imagine if he hadn't allowed himself to get interrupted, if he hadn't allowed God to get his attention. Imagine if he just had written it off as just a dream and, and not given it any weight and broken off the engagement anyway. But he didn't. If we dismiss the plans of God just because we don't understand them or just because they don't look how we think they're going to look, we might miss out on seeing something really great. Joseph allowed God to get his attention. He allowed himself to be interrupted. He chose to be interrupted. And as a result, Joseph became a part of a much bigger picture. He became a part of my story. He became a part of all of your stories. He became a part of God's plan to change and restore us. And despite his chaos, despite his mess, Joseph's life was also changed. I wonder what God is speaking about to us today as we, as we approach the end of the year. What could God be speaking about to us today? God's plans didn't end that night. They didn't end with the birth of Christ. They continue even today. What part do we play in the bigger picture of God's plans? Maybe you're encountering God for the first time and, and you want to get to know him more. Maybe you've known God for ages and, and you're seeking to know his voice, his presence, his will for your life. Maybe you're seeking deeper levels of truth in God. Wherever it is that you are in the plan of God, if you find yourself in the midst of chaos and mess, Allow yourself to be interrupted. Allow God to get your attention. You just never know what will change. For Joseph, his change was a change that would flood the world, fill it with hope, and cause us to be forever changed. Joseph was a man of faith and obedience. He didn't know the full plan. He didn't know all the little details of how things were really going to play out all he knew was the part of the plan that he had in his own hand. The part of the plan to nurture, to grow, to protect God's plan. And for Joseph, that was enough. That was enough to lead him on a journey. That was enough to cause him to partner with the plans of God. I wonder what it would look like if we as the kingdom of God knew the part of God's plan that we had in our hand. What would that look like? And how would, we, how would we steward that? How would we partner with God to extend that? I wonder what could happen. Joseph partnered with the plans of God. He invested himself. It wouldn't have been easy. It would have been, there would have been some really challenging days. Joseph went on to spend the next few years moving from place to place. It would have been challenging. And he would have spent the whole time, I imagine looking over his back, double-checking, watching, is King Herod coming? Is anyone else coming? What's happening? That's kind of exhausting, watching your back the whole time. It's a big responsibility, raising and protecting Jesus. But Joseph was obedient, and he was invested in the plans of God. He waited for instruction, then responded. Waited for instruction, then responded. Waited for instruction, then was responded. Each time instruction came, Joseph responded. Sometimes I think the most important thing that we can do is simply respond. When God speaks to us, when he reveals truth to us, when he, when he rebukes us, when he stirs our hearts and we encounter his presence, when he invites us to partner with him, even in the chaos and mess and all of the things that we don't understand, even if we don't have all the details of the plan, all we need to do is respond. And that's what Joseph did. 
And as he stood there that night, looking down at the manger, Jesus resting peacefully, at that moment, Joseph got a tiny glimpse of the bigger picture. I, I sometimes wonder why they laid Jesus to sleep in a manger. In Luke 2, verse 7, it says, She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. I wonder why they didn't just put him to sleep on some blankets, roll up some blankets or, or put him in a bed or um, just hold him. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if it was a practical decision or if they weren't fans of co-sleeping or something. Maybe they read the research. Um, I, 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 wonder, I wonder what the decision was. Or maybe the decision to lay the baby Jesus in a manger had no practical or functional reason at all. Maybe the decision to lay the baby Jesus in a manger was entirely prophetic. Maybe it was to say that his life would go on to feed our spirits, that his life would go on to bring the water of life that we need to sustain us. Maybe the manger is a reminder that we cannot live on bread and water alone. So what is in the manger of your chaos? Is it stubbornness? Is it impatience? Is it self-doubt? It's all of those for me, just side note. Or could it be the promise of healing, wholeness, peace, life? Is it the promise that we will be forever changed, forever restored, never to be the same again? What is in the manger of your chaos? Some expected a warrior to come with fire and might, power and strength, some expected a king with authority and justice, ruling with kindness. Others expected a hero, someone who was brave and wise and strong and full of heart. But no one expected a child. No one expected a child that would grow to become a teacher. A teacher who would teach us what it means to live with power and strength. A teacher who will teach us how to be warriors. No one expected that he would come as a teacher, teaching us what it means to rule with kindness and, and authority and what it means to live as royalty in the kingdom of God. No one expected a teacher to come and show us with heart and with wisdom and bravery what it means to be heroes in our worlds, heroes that will bring hope to people who don't have it. This Christmas, remember, tomorrow is not the day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Tomorrow is the day when 2,000 years ago, on this very night, God chose to celebrate our birth. He chose to send his son Jesus into our world to establish us as his people that our broke, in our brokenness and sin and imperfection, God initiated a plan solely designed to expose and declare our value, to restore us to the place where we belong. This very night, 2,000 years ago, in the midst of chaos and mess, God arrived. So if the worship guys want to come up, I will pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God of the moment. Lord, that you are a God that meets us where we are at, wherever we're at. God, that you're, you're not just a God of the big picture, but you're a God that cares about, about the smallest things. Lord, and, and today, as we go into to celebrate your birth. Father, I pray that you would help us. Give us eyes to see those around us who, who need to know you, who need to know that there's a hope. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us to um, just reflect on you, God. Help us to keep our eyes out that we would be open to the interruptions, that we would be open to the fact that we don't need to know all the details, but we just need to know who you are and trust that that's enough. Father God, we thank you and we give you all the praise in your mighty name. Thanks, Lisa. I love it. We're going to sing Little Drummer Boy. Do you guys want to stand? Maybe. Let's go, Drummer Boy. Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Yes. I love how you said, Lisa. 2,000 years ago, God celebrated us by sending his son. What a great thought that is. That 2,000 years ago, he declared peace and joy over us in 2017. See, when God declares something, it's an eternal phrase. It's not just for a moment. It's forever. And so tomorrow, we come into his celebration. To be a part of his party. Of his great feast. So, Father, this morning we say thank you that you celebrate over us and we get to join in that great celebration. And so, Father, I pray of these next 24 hours, Lord, let the celebrations begin. Let joy abound. I pray, Father, for those who might be having a difficult time through this Christmas time, that joy might be discovered somewhere where they're not even looking for it. In fact, I pray that joy might interrupt your life. The power and the presence of the King of Kings made interrupt your life this Christmas. And so, Father, I pray today that for those who are unwell, I ask for healing and speak healing back into lives. For those who are feeling flattened down, I speak joy into those lives. For those who are just chomping at the bit for tomorrow to come, may you leak all the things of the kingdom over these next 24 hours and then beyond. And so, Lord, I pray now that you'll just join with us as we go downstairs, have coffee and and water and any, what, anything else that's down there, bless us with the presence of the Father in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on downstairs.